And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, Pat Piso. Uh, he is a retired San Jose a University professor. He taught there for 20 years. He was a materials engineer. He taught materials engineering. And he's the founder of the uh, Capanacitos, CEO, excuse me, Drive Native Plant Streetscape in San Jose. So he's going to be talking all about taking a public area, enlisting the neighborhood, and getting uh, a whole native plant garden uh, planted there. So, um, and I think everybody knows that there's handouts if you'd like to look at those. So let's welcome Pat Piso. Well, good evening. Uh, glad to see that you've got all your Christmas shopping done and were able to attend tonight's talk in the cold. Um, my name is Pat Pizzo, and I wanted to give you a little background about myself uh, uh, and how I got into native gardening, because I am an engineer, and so how did I make the transition? Well, I've always been interested in gardening, landscaping, and plants. Uh, I had a vegetable garden at age eight that was, uh, I lived in Willow Glen on Lincoln Avenue, and we had a neighbor that had an empty, a vacant lot next to our house. So I asked him if it would be okay if I started a garden. Uh, uh, in his uh, vacant field. And uh, I used to grow uh, uh, corn and, and vegetables and tomatoes and so forth and really enjoy that. And then there was, uh, uh, I cut lawns as a kid uh, and went down to Ed's Hobby Shop and bought plastic models and put those together. Uh, but the way I got my money was by taking care of uh, and maintaining the yards. I was taught how to propagate plants from my dad and a neighbor. neighbor. His name was Mr. Luff. Mr. Luff was about 80 years old and had a rose garden. And uh, he taught me how to propagate a rose. He asked me which one I wanted. And, and it was Lavender Lady, this pretty rose. And, and so uh, at a, I was probably eight or less that he showed me how to prune roses and how to, how to propagate them. So it was quite an experience. And then uh, my dad, who loved to, to plant plants when he had the time, uh, he taught me how to graft citrus and avocado. We had an avocado tree in the yard, and it was one of those uh, black avocados. I don't know the variety uh, name, uh, but they're black more than green. And uh, we had this huge tree my mother started from a pit in a, in a jar with the toothpicks and so on. And we planted it in a couple of containers and moved them on and put it in the yard. And this tree grew to be about this big around, but we never had any fruit off of it. So one day my father goes out there, and he takes a, a razor blade, and he razor cuts a one-inch band of of uh, cambium layer all around the tree. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't stay in one place. So he, he uh, took one inch all around the tree except for one inch. And I said, Dad, you're going to kill this tree, you know? And he said, no, I'm shocking it so it'll produce fruit. The next year we had avocado. That was really kind of, it's called stressing the tree. And uh, so Dad, Dad knew how to graft and stuff, and I learned that from him. When I was 12, the uh, president of Fuchsia Society of Santa Clara Valley lived down the street and he saw me cut lawns and caring for things. So he was going to go on a three week vacation. He had fuchsias. And, and these things need uh, attention. You have to water and care for fuchsia, uh, especially in the hot summer, which was when he took his vacation. So I took care of his yard. And, and, uh, and so I, I, I thought he saw something that could trust me to do that. So I, I kind of. Uh, I uh, did all these things, uh, but, but, but went into engineering because I love science and math. But I always had to see in the back of my mind uh, uh, gardening and so on. And so uh, uh, hiking introduced me to native plants, and I joined the California Native Plant Society about, about uh, uh, 2000 when I retired. I told my wife, Diane, I was going to take the millennium off. And uh, so I, I took hikes, learned about native plants, and I liked what I saw, and so I had, in 2000, when I retired, I began a demo garden where I live uh, along in Oak Canyon. And I'm going to show you here uh, a picture of, of what Oak Canyon is kind of like. Now, these are not native. These are drop-resistant Mediterranean plants, and these are cystus and rock roses. Uh, but but in the area kind of exemplifies what's there. There's this street, Capitan Silas, and then there's this the curb, uh, and then a 10 uh, feet in is the city property, and then there are these boulders that the water district put there to keep cars from going in and dumping things and so on. And then uh, there's the Guadalupe Creek, which comes out at Hicks Road and goes down to the Guadalupe River and the Alamitas, and they flow out to uh, downtown San Jose and out the bay. So uh, uh, it's a lovely area, and all that was there 
uh, before 94 was just the dirt and the boulders. And there weren't, it wasn't dirt, it was weeds and, and boulders. So uh, the, the residents of Oak Canyon planted 128 uh, Quercus agafoli or Coast Live Oak. And then I got involved in planting a Coast Live Oak for, oak for my grandson on a, as an Arbor Day project, and that kind of started it all. And it's about uh, six tenths of a mile long, this area, all along the Capitan Silos Meadow, along Capitan Silos Drive. Now, my expertise, do I have expertise in all things California native plants? I don't. What I, what I really have uh, focused on and have some experience with is the chaparral plants. Because that zone is high and dry. There is no water there. It only gets the natural water. And, uh, and the natural rocky dirt that's there uh, and has been for years. Uh, and I grow uh, a drought tolerant uh, uh, plants, uh, mainly California native plants. Uh, the demo is a demo garden in that I have the plants planted between the trees and I have labels on them and so forth. Uh, but I also have a demo, demo garden, now, uh, garden now that I started in the Martin and Fontana uh, parks. Uh, uh, these parks are along the pg e corridor with all the power transmission cables running down to Almaden Expressway from Coleman. T.J. Martin is the first narrow park there and then it's J. Fontana. And these part, the pg e came in in 2010 and said we're going to take out 170 trees. The neighbors rebelled and, and so we formed a group and we are fighting the loss of those trees but we're also trying to compensate and one way to compensate is using native plants in what I call a berm or an island uh, as, as landscape alternative to small trees which is our other option. So we're planting small trees and California native plants and so that's another major project that I have. You have lists, or there are handout lists of the plants in the, the two Fontana projects and the Capitan Silos project. Uh, today we're going to talk more broadly about California native plants. Uh, I want to show you this, which is the, one of the islands uh, in Fontana Park. It's in Fontana West near Meridian and Oak Glen. And this part, uh, this ha has a wonderful display of natives. These boulders were there, but all in a pile, and we kind of gave it some character by placing them carefully and having this mound by adding the garden soil and creating a mound. Why did we create that mound? Because these native plants do not want their root crowns uh, uh, in standing water or wet. And so I, I like to use a berm to prop them up, and they won't be in that condition. Uh, and the native plants we have in there are there are a variety of them. I'll show you a little uh, corner of one, the red buckwheat, which is over in the back upper left. Uh, the sage hat is bees bliss, salvia bees bliss. And here is a prostrate coyote bush, uh, which is a wonderful plant, it forms a wonderful mound. Right now they're one gallon. These plants tend to mound out. This is a picture I, I stole off the internet and it's a, a Bacchus polaris twin peaks most likely. It's a prostate coyote bush and you can get some idea here of how this plant mounds up and out. Uh, it's evergreen, it's a wonderful landscape plant and you hardly have to do anything to it. Uh, once in a while a branch will dry out or kind of die back but you rake it out and more green comes in and you know heals that area. Uh, so I, I, my plants are what I call foundation plants for a native garden. Now here's another area of Fontana Park and you see here we've created a mound. There used to be right where that center rock is a cluster of, of coast live oak trees that the squirrels planted. And these were volunteer trees and right overhead you can see a a, pop, a transmission tower in the background, up in the upper part of that picture. Uh, there are cables, 230 kilovolt cables coming right over the top. So pg &E doesn't want a, a Quercus agrifolia growing there, okay? So we take them out and we create this mound and we plant uh, California native plants. Uh, this is from a different perspective, but you can see we've placed, by the way, the, the boulders that you see were all under that tree. And all we knew is there's a rock under there. Look at that rock. When we took the trees away, it was eight big boulders. And so we thought, wow, this is great. So we, we did a, a, 
uh, what do you call it, feng shi, uh, kind of thing. <laughs> and, and we set the boulders where they would, uh, you know, give the best balance and so forth. I, I think we did a pretty good job. And then we put the plants in November 10th. Now, why did, yes, sir? When you took the trees out, uh, did you just cut them off at the base? Uh, how, what, what else did you do? The, did these you... trees were the largest ones were about two oh, or three inches okay. in diameter. Yes, they cut them off at the ground. That's what PG&E did in removing the tree. But then when I had the guy come in with this front loader to carry these rocks around, because they're huge, they weigh a ton, uh, I had him uh, pull those out, okay. the roots. So we pulled them out by the roots. Now sometimes what I'll do is cut it off and I'll take three copper nails and, and nail three copper nails in it and that will kill the tree and, and it kill the stump and it will not get sprouts. Uh, if it's larger, I'll put five nails around the periphery. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get copper nails at, at the plumbing department or Art Orchard Supply for a buck, you know, or two bucks. And it's an easy way to do it, uh, but we pulled the roots out in this instance. And uh, so that's that native plant island seed. And I encourage you, if you uh, uh, want to see uh, kind of new starting native plant gardens and the kind of spacing that's required, you know, you might look at those. Now I'm going to tell you about what are California native plants, how they are unique, because they are unique. And, and you have to understand that before you start gardening uh, uh, with it. The suitability for the traditional garden. I think that they are suitable and you just have to look at your situation and figure out what do they, what kind of conditions do they require, where can I meet those conditions, and then start some, something there and, and, and give it a try. What are some of the best of the best drop resistant plants? I can tell you about that because that's my area that I have some expertise in. And where can I see them in the garden setting? We'll talk about that. Availability of information and availability of plants, where do you get these things? And um, caring for native plants. I'm going to interject some thoughts about caring, such as keeping those root crowns high and dry. Um, now this is a, a bush, a silver bush lupin. And, oh, I'm sorry. This is a silver bush lupin, and it's one of the prettiest plants in the spring. Here we have March or, or April, uh, seventh year, we're back a few years ago. And here's this wonderful looking plant with these wonderful uh, uh, arrays of flowers. Here's a close up of some of the flowers. This is lupins, albifrons, a silver bush lupin. And they have now a variety of colors. I went to uh, Native Revival in Aptus, and uh, the people at Aptus had a bunch of these. On sale, they were trying to get, get close to stock because they didn't have them all labeled and they didn't know what colors they, they had in which pots. And so I randomly picked three of them up and I got this one and I like this one the best. Some of them are blue, you know, very blue. This color that you see is, is about right. Uh, it's that true, true color representing. Unfortunately, I've lost this guy this year. I think uh, 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 we uh, have had a few dry years in a row. And the moisture content in the soil isn't very good, you know, it's really dry deep. And we, comp uh, you tend to compensate with water when it's hot and dry, because you're, you, you want water, so probably this plant wants water. And so you tend to maybe water at times when you should, especially in the months of end of July and August and September. Uh, you really, these plants are gone to sleep. And if you try to wake them up by watering them up, you do more harm than good. And there are funguses and things that will thrive under hot and wet conditions that are deadly to native plants. So, so uh, we made a mistake somehow with this plant, and I, I think I lost it. Uh, two years ago, I thought I lost it. Uh, and I, cut it, I went to cut it back, and I saw one leaf at the bottom, and uh, I said, wait a minute, it's still got life in it. And that year, it came back as a bush again. And for two more years, I've had it. This year, I don't see the leaf. I don't see the leaf. I just see the dead. Now, this is a plant that has a bad hair day. You know, California native plants have bad hair days. Uh, um, uh, the bush lupin is exquisite at this time of year. As you go into August, the leaves become really small, and the plant kind of dried out looking, and so on. 
But you know what? I plant this in the background. I, in, in some areas, I have these behind other plants, like behind the ceanothus. And so I get the full color effect in the spring, and then it, it kind of goes away. And, and I've got another plant which is taking over and giving me a show of a different kind in the summer. So I can have them both. And nobody says, boy, what an ugly plant that is, because they're not focusing on it. You've got an evergreen out in front of it, you know? So you've got to uh, balance these around in the garden. The, the plants and the colors on this are beautiful. I have a neighbor, it starts flowering low, and then as it goes up, more flowers open, and the, 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 this is in the pea family, so the, the, the little pea pods start forming. And they're not the most attractive thing, but I have a neighbor who doesn't like them, so he comes along, he takes his hand, and he goes up and takes all the pea pods off, and so it's always got just flowers never flowers with the pea pot, so it always, looks, it always looks great. I don't know who it is that does that, but someone does that all the time at, in, in Catholic and Silos. Yes? Now you probably don't have a lot of snails in your There are, area. that's a good point. Yeah. That, that when you have, uh, for example, in this garden, a geranium grows. Somebody planted this geranium years ago on the dry side of the street and do you know what? The geranium is a drought tolerant plant. That thing has leaves and flowers all the time. And it never gets eaten because there's never enough moisture there for the snails to survive. There are no snails on that plant. And this, this was a real a revelation to me because I hate geranium. Uh, you know, we used to have geranium at home and the snails would be all over it. And, and we'd water, you know, we would water, we'd always have water and moisture. But these are on the dry side of the street, and so these lupins are snail free, mm -hmm. and so the geranium is snail free, and they, they're beautiful year round. Yeah. So it is an unusual environment, and you can, you know, how do you create that in your garden? If you want this kind of plant, you can't have a sprinkler near it. You know, you, you have to provide a dry area with good drainage to have this plant in the garden, and you have to keep it dry. You've got to, uh, Avoid the temptation of wanting to water like your other plants because it's on a different cycle. Anybody know what these are? Mimulus? <laughs> Mimulus, the monkey flowers, and they're beautiful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. the California, uh, the northern part of California has uh, gold and yellow ones, and the southern states are some red varieties. And uh, 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 you know, people in the nursery business get together with these two colors and work out a whole spectrum of colors of, of mimulus. You can get the, the Trish, which is kind of this burgundy shade, and there's a white uh, one, I forget what the name of it is, but you, there are all kinds of variety. Now, the, the, the names on these have, have kind of changed. First of all, I want to show you another kind of mimulus which is, uh, uh, these are all woody stemmed, these three. This one is uh, herbaceous, you know, it's kind of like pansies, uh, and, and uh, uh, other flowers you plant in the spring that you can buy at Orchard Supply. And now Orchard Supply is sending, selling six packs of these multicolored uh, um, mimulus. These are native plants, they grow in wet areas along riparian zones and in grassy meadows and such. And you can buy them in the spring. Uh, it, all of them are still called mimulus, but there's a, there, there is another, the woody types really are the placus. Does that sound right? Sounds good. The placus, they're not mimulus. They separate these two families of the her herbaceous and the, the dry stem of, of, of ones. And these are the ones that are chaparral. These would never grow where, where I'm growing these drought resistant plants. But you, if you have a moist, uh, uh, a little bit of water and some sun requirements that these plants like, you could put this type of mimulus in your garden and wonderful color spots. Now here's a, a picture of some plants along Capitan Silas and I want to make the point that you can, you can mix and match them. Now these are not all natives. There's a Galicia speciosa right in the center of that, that light green area in the center with those red flowers. And these are freesia out here that a neighbor had planted previously. I didn't know they were there until the spring. They all, bulbs came up and they're wonderful. Freesias are, are, are fragrant as anything. 
Uh, and I can't take those out, the neighbor planted them there. But it makes a nice, you see, I've got, I've got the monkey flower in the back, mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, Galicia speciosa. And the Galicia speciosa tomorrow night is going to have a challenge because it's freezing in this valley tomorrow night. We're going to have a freeze. It'll be uh, no, no clouds, uh, radiation out to space and it's going to fall below freezing. So put your sensitive plants away and cover your citrus if you want or whatever, water the citrus. And, uh, uh, but this needs protection. This Galicia speciosa is one of the, of the California native plants is one of the only ones I know that's really frost sensitive. Okay, it, it has died back in the garden a, a couple of times, but it, it has come back again. But it will get a frost, a frost will attack that. And um, I, I really like, so, so here's, a, here's how you can mix and match. You see, in a traditional garden with some California natives, as long as that area back there doesn't have a sprinkler in it, you maybe shut that one off. Okay? The, the Cianothus, uh, one of the most beautiful plants. Uh, this is a Weir Canyon. I'm losing this one. It's killing me. This, this is my favorite Cianothus in the garden. And, Again, I don't know exactly why, but half the branches are starting to die back. You know, the fellow down, uh, Bart Wilson down there at, at, um, at uh, Las Politas Nursery with his beautiful web pages, he'll tell you, Cianothus when water will have a short life. So the Cianothus um, uh, Winter Canyon, you saw that plant is about three foot tall and about four foot wide. It's a, you know, it's a nice mounded plant. <laughs> And it's evergreen. It gives you those flowers in the spring. How can you not love, you know, those plants? Now, some people say cenotes are too big for, for my garden. Well, there are cenotes that are probably too big, but there are all sizes of cenotes. So you have some large ones uh, that can grow to 12 feet. Uh, the Ray Hartman, you have uh, some uh, cenotes that are around three foot high, four foot wide, like Concha. And, and, and Wheeler Canyon, and you have some little puppies, you know, or, and ground covers that you can put out. Uh, so don't think of, of Cianothus as being one size. They're multi-size Cianothus. The other thing is Manzanitas. Uh, Manzanitas come in all sizes, and there's one, for example, called um, uh, um, uh, Sphere. Glow, uh, I think it's glow or whatever. It's a small little cyanothus that forms a round mound and is slow growing. What a perfect container for it, you see. Uh, so back to this cyanothus. Cyanothus Wheeler Canyon, we talked about that. Here it is a little earlier. This is the same plant, but it's in March. It's earlier in March, March 6th. And you see all of the burgundy color on it? That burgundy color is the petals and, and sepals that, not petals, but uh, 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 silent, what do they call it? Uh, I'll, I'll get it in the next slide. It's what covers the flower before the flower, the, the inflorescence comes out. Sepals. Sepals. And the sepals are burgundy shade. And it's lovely like, it's lovely at that point. So you just look at these things. You know, aren't they beautiful? And then they start to do this. You see, and the blue flowers come out. Now I have blue and burgundy as I'm walking along there. And then the full display. Now look at how many flowers are on that thing. And the a thing about these native plants is what they draw. Yes, go ahead. And how big is that? That plant is about, again, three and a half feet tall and about four feet wide. Four feet? Okay. Four feet, four feet. Okay. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, what it attracts is, bees that you've never seen on your, you'll see a few domestic bees on this, but most of the bees are native bees that don't live in hives and so forth, but are singular uh, native bees, bubble bees and so forth, and, and they will, and wasp little tiny bees and big bees, and they'll swarm this thing, and they're there for the whole month, collecting the pollen and so on. And so, you know, seeing the attraction of Things that are out there that didn't have an op don't have an opportunity to come and do their thing in your own traditional garden. Putting one of these native plants in there brings them all out. It's quite something to see. Yes, ma'am. I've heard about 
25 seat members in my yard in their angry days, and they, this is going into their, um, they're like two years old, and they've never bloomed. Do they need to just get more adult like to bloom? Well, yes, go ahead and answer that. I, I think so. Okay. Plant, you know, plants, uh, flowers are, it's a sexual thing. Okay, just like so humans, you, you need yeah. to reach puberty. Okay, all right. But that's a great green plant. Yeah, okay. Okay. Now, this is uh, salvia, Cleveland sage. And these are the flower heads uh, uh, before they've opened. And a friend of mine goes around with high digital cameras taking pictures. And I didn't know that I had created a community of life with this plant. I mean, here, when, you, when I opened up this picture, I was, you know, you have ants going up to collect the, the honeydew from the little aphids that are there. You have the aphids on the plant, and then you have the predator, uh, ladybugs going around after the, ape, after the aphids. There's a whole community of life going on with this thing. And I created it just by putting this in the garden. And I thought that was really a, a cool, and there are little birds that come around in the Ceanothus and the other plants. They're all titmouse and other little tiny birds, and they're quiet and they, they're magical. I mean, you, you think that, the, was that a bird? No, I, can't, I don't see a bird. Then you, you start walking, you know two birds just went by, but you can't find them, you can't see them there. And they walk along with you into the bushes, and it's really kind of, Neat that you created this this community for all these living things. See it like uh, uh, see you know, this aren't just blue. You can get pink and white and, and, and some other colors. This is snow flurry, and it's a, a, a great name for this plant. It's a large plant. This one's about 12 feet tall and about 10 or 12 feet wide. The deer prune it for me. They prune the bottom and the top of the plant has all the flowers and so forth. So it looks like an umbrella effect, you know. And it's really great. Um, uh, I love this one and when it opens in the spring, also in March. And <clears throat> here's some, uh, uh, see you know, this time putting in the native garden, or what's becoming a native garden over in Fontana. Um, and uh, this happens to be uh, uh, frosty blue, a see you know, that's, that's about intermediate size, maybe at seven foot tall, seven foot wide. And it has beautiful blue flowers, uh, kind of a light blue, frosty blue. And I want to point out that frame under there. What I've done is I've taken a redwood two by six and made a frame to get that root crown six inches above the standing ground here, you see? So that everywhere we've planted one of these ceanothus, we've raised the root crown of it in this manner so that the crown stays high and dry, these plants should survive. Uh, many years. Keep the root crown high and dry for all your native plants. This is a manzanita, not the best picture in the world. It's called Austin Griffith. Um, it's in December. It's flowering December. What, what plants do you have that flower in December? Christmas cactus, you know, a few things that we can name. But here you have a uh, manzanita and a wonderful display of these little pink bells. You know, and the insects uh, collect uh, on those. And uh, this plant is a mounded plant that's, I guess it's going to grow pretty big, but it's slow growing. I've had it in there for like um, four or five years, and it's still only about this tall and, and about this big around. But it has a wonderful, it's a wonderful shape, larger leaf manzanita. I like that one a lot. Uh, here's a manzanita in a, in a container. How can you introduce natives in your garden? Why not put them in a container? And you don't have to water these much. You know, I, I don't water this container that much. You see some pine needles in there, because uh, they like a little bit of acid soil. They grow with pine, pine areas with pine trees and so forth. So I put pine needles in there to balance the soil. And I, I swear sometimes when I see that the manzanita looks a little peaked, and it just doesn't look like the leaves are stiff and straight like they should be, I go out and I grab pine needles along Coleman Avenue put them in a bag and I carry them over there and I put them around that tree. And within a couple of days, I swear, those manzanita are happier than they were before. So they, they like a little shot of acid. I keep it away from a lot of my other natives, but I'll put it in and around manzanita. Isn't that a, a pretty little potted plant? The little white flowers in, in January, February. 
This one is, uh, uh, kids go to a school that has an auction, a silent auction. So I uh, give plants and containers for the silent auction to raise money for the school. This is uh, a hummingbird sage in a little pot. Uh, and, you know, uh, again, I'm trying to show you that you can take in a plant. It doesn't like full sun all the time, but it likes a pretty good exposure sun, so I can take the pot and put it in the right place, you know, and provide it just what it, what it wants, and then I'm careful how I water it. A very fragrant plant. Again, uh, this was a point I was making when the thing went off. Low, medium, and tall. When you say, I want a manzanita, well, here's a, kind of a ground cover, only a, maybe a foot and a half to two foot high, filling in a nice area, but you could have a big old Dr. Herd, you know, up against your house. Isn't that a beautiful place to put that Dr. Herd, or to have that Dr. Herd? Uh, they have opened up the trunk there, and man, those leaves are huge, the red peeling bark. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful plant for a, for a, a native plant for the, for the garden. Now, here you can prune them open to show and expose that, or you can grow a hedgerow of these things. Now, this is a large manzanita. I don't know what particular type, probably a doctor herd, but you can see it's, it's large, maybe going down. Uh, I think this was taken from the, uh, the beach over there, Silomar. Uh, but you, you know, so they want a screen, they want a big screen, so they don't prune so you can see the bark, they leave it the way it is. Um, this is uh, during Drempen Harfordi, uh, or Island Bush Poppy. These are big yellow poppies, they're just beautiful. This was one of the most awesome plants I've had in the garden. Everybody loves it when they plant them first couple of years. Then what happens? Does anybody know? The leaves start drying and they hang on to the plant. And, uh, and it starts producing less flowers. And so, but what I do is I cut them back. And I try to stimulate that new growth and that new display to get a couple of years of really fantastic display from them. These things were flowering when I planted them almost the whole year. Some, this was the peak, but there were flowers on that plant almost the whole year. And people just love that. But when they try to grow them and they find that they, they have these dead leaves, they want to remove them from the garden. I remove the dead leaves and cut them off, and then I cut them back to get new growth. Uh, so I like that plant. It's still there in, my, in the garden at the uh, at, uh, Catholic Pensillas. How am I doing time-wise? Am I? Uh, it's uh, 6.40. So what does that mean? About uh, 20 seven, minutes? I think we have to be out of here by 7.30. OK. This is Barbaris Navini, or Nevin Barberry, and I love this, this plant. I like to look the form. These are gray green leaves that have prickles that you wouldn't believe. They're really sharp. When I go to eat the red berries off this, I have to carefully maneuver my hand in there so it doesn't get wiped out by those thorns. Uh, the deer will go up there, put their mouth over the whole thing, and just pull them all off with their mouth. I don't know how they do that. Uh, they must have a very tough inner, inner parts of their mouth and tongue. But um, the little, the, the, yellow, the yellow flowers here in March, a full display of little tiny yellow flowers, and they hang on quite a, quite a long time. This is from Southern California. Some would say, we're not planting a real California native plant because it doesn't grow anywhere near you. But, but I take a broader view. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but this plant is from Southern California. Does well up here. It, I don't have to water or do anything to this thing anymore. That's just on its own. And that thing is about four foot tall and four foot wide. And um, the little every yellow, yellow flower makes a little berry. The berry starts out light red, gets medium red, and then it gets dark red. When they're dark red, they are sweet and tart. And I get a boost out of them. <laughs> they must have a high oxygen content or something. But I eat these berries. I really do eat them. Down there. And, and I, I love these things, and they're they're tiny. You don't get you know you have to pick a lot of them to get much. But um, uh, a very interesting plant. So I have red on this thing all till uh, uh, when did it? Start? I say mid August. You know, I, I, so color all the whole summer. Yes. And um, when are the berries ripe? Are they ripe right in August or September? Yeah, in 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 uh, late July or mid August okay. that time frame. Very, very, very good, but you've got to get, if you eat them too early, they're really tart, not sweet. To get that sweetness, you've got to see them dark red. 
We just reviewed drought-resistant foundation plants, or there are other plants, you know, we've got California bulbs and native ferns, grasses, perennials, all kinds of plants, the trees and, and conifers and wildflowers, and there's other plant communities, like the desert community, where I get some of my plants. Uh, I have a, um, a uh, desert willow. Are you familiar with that small little tree? I'll show you. Um, but, but you have a, a palette that is extremely broad. By showing you just the one, the chaparrales, I'm not giving you any sense of the full, the full nature of what's available to you. Why not try a patch of wildflowers in your garden? And you can grow lupin and tidy tips and poppies and so on. And if you give them a, a little bit of water, you extend their blooming period. Uh, when they are dry and the neighbors start saying, what are those weeds over there? Take those out. You know, and you, now some people like to form a seed bed, but you can remove all those plants, rework the soil the next October, plant more seeds from learners or ants, and you can have another wonderful display year after year of, of California native wildflowers. Uh, the lupin, and you know, mixing these colors is, is uh, awesome, a lot of fun. So there's a lot of a variety. I have maiden's hair fern in our yard in a corner where there's some shade so it gets sun maybe till 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock and then it, it's got heat and high and dry. I don't water it ever, but it, well I do water a little bit. I've got a, 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 a what do you call it, a drip system that comes on about once a week in that area that'll give it some water. But that maiden hair fern has been there for years, and it's the worst corner. I can't plant anything else there, so I plant maiden hair fern. I like the look and and of maiden hair fern, very delicate and green, and doesn't require a lot of care, which I like. Once in a while, I'll and they have wonderful black stems. You know, they have deep black uh, the stems on them, and I take some and plant them in a pot, and then I sell them at that uh, at that auction. Uh, there are uh, uh, succulents. Um, uh, Dudley. Dudley. Dudley, there's a variety of Dudleys. I have one native garden enthusiast who likes to plant pots with uh, Dudley. And he puts the Dudley in there because they're easy to care for. He, you know, uh, they're beautiful. They, make a, they go through a flower period. And uh, he just has a wonderful collection of a variety of different Dudleys, all from California. The, uh, so rock garden, it's perfect for rock garden. In fact, you saw those boulders. I plant Dudley up between the boulders. And so I have spots of Dudley out in the garden. And then there are bulbs like blue dicks here, which give you a nice color spot, and they'll plant it in and amongst other things in your garden. And here we have uh, grassland, uh, uh, you know, replacing your lawn, big, big topic now. Uh, and this, these grasses are like bunch grasses, a lot of them. And you cut them higher than you would cut a lawn. But you get this wonderful, eventually you fill in, the weeds can't get in there, and you have a wonderful display of green uh, from these California uh, native grasses. We've had a, we had a presentation this last uh, year on just that, replacing your lawn. Uh, musical herb, this is inside, okay? At the auction, I, 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 put, I create some stuff out of wire. I wanted to share a few things with you here. So I have wire from Orchard Supply and I roll and I straighten it out and I bend it and I cut it and I weld it. I, I braise it together. And this is a musical I call herb box with the herbs down there. Does anybody, can anybody read music and know what that is? Da, 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 da. That's what it's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, that's an aside. Now, what is a California native plant? This is the California Floristic Province. Now, some people base everything inside this province is a California native plant. But look where this province is, up into Oregon. Uh, it, it looks like it may even go to Washington a little bit. Down here, certainly goes into Mexico. It includes all these islands, including Sandros Island, which is like six or 700 miles southeast of Los Angeles, San Diego. So, you see how broad this area is? All the plants in here have a common environment, the Mediterranean kind of environment, and these are the California floristic province, so anything you pick from there is, in the broad sense, considered a California native plant. So you might have in your garden a Cedros Island verbena, 
which is a purple flowering, uh, a wonderful little plant. Doesn't do so well in my conditions, I found, because maybe I don't give it enough water in that hot and dry. Uh, it might need a little bit more water to do really well. But it's a, it's a beautiful looking uh, plant. But it's from Cedros Island, down, way down uh, on the uh, west coast of uh, Mexico. And here's a plant from the desert, uh, uh, the uh, desert willow. Uh, wonderful bark, twisting bark, makes these wonderful flowers here. Look at those flowers. Aren't they beautiful? Uh, hummingbirds love these things. Uh, more common to say to uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, if you're from those areas, you're probably familiar with these. They probably use them as street trees and in containers and so on. Uh, I have them here both in, in all three projects. So uh, this summer, you can go and see them. They'll be in bloom in June, maybe July. Oh, that was the name, uh, Shalopsis linearis, desert willow. And you can get them in different colors. There's a beautiful white with a little bit of purple up in the De Anza display garden up there at De Anza College. How many, have you ever been up there? See, if, if you get a chance to go in that arboretum uh, uh, on the campus of De Anza Community College, uh, it's worth a visit. It's about a two acres site of native plants with a creek running through it. You know, an artificial creek. California Mediterranean climate is, is, is where our plants grow and areas with Mediterranean climate include Chile, uh, they include North Africa, of course, Turkey and Italy and southern France, and then in Australia. Uh, this is where a lot of our drought tolerant plants that are good to put in this area come from. You know, it's, and, and we focus on the, the ones in the California the foresty province up there. Now, the Mediterranean climate is pretty typical of most lands in the Mediterranean. We know what it is. It's warm to hot, dry summers and mild to cool, wet winters, at least for now. We don't know where we're going with our climate. Capitacilla's garden is uh, happy with about 16 inches of rainfall. I don't know what the rainfall is in your area, but, but I know those plants I've shown you are happy with 16 inches of water. And I also think they, they, they get a, a water twice a month during Ju uh, July. Uh, June to September. We water uh, twice a month. And the watering is, is frankly getting the spider webs off and the dust off the leaves. And then a little, just, you know, by that means giving some moisture to the soil. But it's not, you know, a lot of water at the crown for a long time with a hose, that kind of thing. So we don't water them heavily, but we do water them. The best time of year for California native plants in terms of display is March to mid June, I think. You know, those are the really beautiful time to see these plants. Uh, they begin to shut down in August. And they really do shut down. I mean, they go to sleep. They don't want to be bothered. Don't water them. You know, just leave them be. And then with the first rains of October, now our first rains weren't until November almost, November 1st. Uh, uh, until those first rains come, uh, they're asleep. Now when you get the first rains, their juices start flowing. This is their spring. This weather outside is spring for California native plants. Their flowering period is kind of like the middle, toward the middle and end of their cycle because they're producing flowers and seeds. So these, these native plants have to remember this cycle that they're on. Their spring, when they start putting out new leaves and all, is just now starting, okay, with these first rains we've had. And you'll see them perk up about, about now. The broadest plant availability is in August and September, although anymore you can get native plants almost year round. The native plant, uh, so Santa Clara Valley chapter has two plant sets in spring and in fall. And you can get good plants there either time. If you buy them in the spring, that plant may sit in that garden, not do much until the first rains the next year. So the, the best time to plant them is in October, November. But you know, landscapers and people who design gardens can't just plant in one month. They got to plant all year round out of business. So they, they provide conditions to keep those plants healthy until they get out on their own and then until they get established, okay? So um, you must supplement water 
in dry years or months, they, you remember when they come from the nursery, they're not drought tolerant at all. They've been given water weekly, okay? So, and they're in containers and the water stands there. So, you have to transition that over time to become that drought tolerant native plant. So, so a lot of times people plant that and say, well, you told me not to water, you know, they're, they're drop tolerant, don't water them during June, July, and August, and so on. It just came from the nursery. You've got to nurse that thing through and give it some water. Put your finger down in the soil there and see if there's moisture in that soil, but any the water flowing through. Maybe the water's just running off and the dirt underneath is totally dry. You've got to have water in, the, in that root ball. Oh, here's another wire. This is, uh, who's that? Snoopy, right on this house. Don't highly supplement soil with amendment. You don't have to put a lot of organic content into the native soil. They love the native soil. They like the, the worse it is, the better they like it, kind of. You don't want to add a bunch of organic amendment like you would in a traditional garden. Check that root condition at the nursery. Native plants don't sell like hotcakes, so sometimes that one gallon plant's been there a while and the roots are all on the outer, circling of the, the wagons. And if you just take that plant and don't massage them, and I, what I would do is I would go get, wait and get another one somewhere else or another one they bring the next batch in. Because once you get a root bound plant, they continue that root boundness. And you can't, it's tough to break away from it. So try to get a plant that's not root bound. Tell the nurseryman, take that plant out for me. Let me see the roots. Get it out of that pot. Let me take a look. See what I've got to work with. You see a bunch of roots going around and all this thing. I'll see you next week. Can you order, order me a younger one? You know? Because uh, uh, you put it in there three years later, nothing's happened with that plant. You're pulling your hair out, and then the thing dies. And you, what, you gotta start all over again. You know? So, so root bound is a problem. Uh, they could occur anywhere in the sequence of the plant. Don't use sprinklers, use drip with caution and then take them off the drip when the plant's mature. You won't, don't need the drip anymore. Good drainage is important for healthy native plants and use mulch until they self mulch. You know, a, a, a Ceanothus will drop its leaves and the leaves will die and will uh, be a mulch around the base of that plant. That's the best mulch for that plant. The best mulch for oak is dead oak leaves, okay? So try to use the natural mulch. This is root bound plant. This was a one gallon, I bought it as a five gallon plant. I planted it. Four years later it died. I, what did I do wrong? I picked it out of the ground and it was root bound. There was no chance for that thing. So I lost four years. I, I can't lose four years anymore. <laughs> I don't have that many four year periods left. So check for root balance. These are some other creations. Uh, Florida Lee, that's supposed to be Sherlock Holmes smoking his pipe over there and, and the hearts and so forth. They sell like hotcakes over there, but it's never, it never meets the cost of materials and the labor <laughs> into it. I know what they mean by a starving artist now. I didn't know what they meant before, but I do now. Where can I visit native plants to see them in my life? Go online. A uh, great sign is Los Pelitas. I don't I think it might be LAS, isn't it? Or is yeah. it LAS? Yeah, Los Pelitas. LAS? Yes. Yeah, Los Pelitas Nursery, uh, and explore their pages. It answers almost any question you may have. This guy, Bart Wilson, down there is, is something else. He's a character, but I, I really believe everything he writes and posts on that sheet. Get on the April Going Native Garden Tour list. Take a hike. Go out on some of these sponsored field trips by the Santa Clara Valley chapter. There are demo gardens at Fontana, Capitalist, Valley Water has one right down by their headquarters building. Or take a Saturday tour of the nurseries. Now, I'll just mention a few of the nurseries. Uh, but first, there are plenty of books. Here's some books that are on the shelf I pulled off of the library here. Eight of them, and one of them is California Native Plants for the Garden. And uh, this book is, is a terrific book. And uh, it's kind of like a coffee book with lots of great pictures, but also has wonderful text to introduce you to, to native plant gardening. And there are other books there. So the Almaden Valley Nursery, we're familiar with that, right? Down, down here, down the road on Almaden Expressway. Um, that, that out, uh, you can order native plants through the Almaden Valley Nursery. 
Payless Nursery at King near Capital had Wanda, who was a native plant person, and she'll sell you some wonderful native plants. Summer Winds has their plant table, a native plant table at most Summer Winds. The best one is in Palo Alto, the, the, the best stock Summer Winds uh, uh, native plant table. Santa Clara Valley CMPS has spring and fall plant sales. Oh, Yerba Buena is gone. I think today was the last day, or tomorrow's the last day. Do, do, do you know that? Have you heard of that garden? Is that closing? They're, they're, they're closing. closing. Oh, they moved. Well, they moved. They moved. But I mean, the site that we know and love is gone. It's going to be a development of some sort. And so uh, Gerda, who started that demo garden there, I think they even pulled some of the plants out there earlier and moved them some other places. Um, uh, so where are they going? They're going to uh, uh, move Bay. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, and they'll start something there to be terrific, too. But, you know, Native Revival over the hill, I don't know if you've been over there. You, you, they've got a demo garden. It's about five or six years uh, developed now. It's very nice. Um, Native Revival in Aptus is, a, is a, a place to go. So what if I have other questions? You know, there are so many references that, uh, uh, from the California Native Plant Society page that I don't have to list them for you, provide a list. It's there online uh, at that address. And they have a ton of references you know, to answer your questions like, who can I get to help coordinate my garden? You know, if, is there a landscape person you can put me in, charge, in touch with? What books are good? All that kind of thing, what field trips, when are they? That Native Plant Tour, They'll give you information about when those tours are in April. Wonderful to go on those on those tours to find out how people uh, have developed the native plants in their garden. So I'm sorry it went kind of long. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. And I have some uh, questions, Pat. Yes. Right. And, yes. Well, 